first thing I want to say is do not believe anything I say today. Um, because uh, there are a lot of charismatic and people making grandiose claims about finding things in the Bible, Noah's Ark, Mount Sinai, Ark, you know, all those things. People make grandiose claims. So don't believe a word I say. Uh, be like the Bereans. The Bereans were called noble because they check things out against Scripture. And if things match with Scripture, then pay attention to what I or somebody else has to say. There's a lot of people out there giving a lot of misinformation. So use, be students of the Bible, and notice today that everything we do is based on Scripture. The Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. God is the author, salvation is the end, and truth without any mixture of error is the content. The Bible is and shall remain the supreme standard by which we live, by which we should vote, by which we should raise our children, the supreme standard by which we should tithe, the supreme standard by which we should repair breached relationships. The Bible is the answer, and the world is looking to man when we should be looking to Christ. Now, that being said, I'm going to show you a video in a few minutes on the search for Mount Sinai. It has absolutely gotten so much steam that now we have people all over the world, top universities, Hebrew University, uh, that are coming to us and saying, this is amazing. Uh, this is the, uh, the mo one of the most holy places in the world. It's where God came down and touched and burnt the rocks on top of Mount Sinai. And we think we have evidence that is very compelling and hopefully it'll inspire you in your faith walk. Now, how did I get involved in all this? Well, I originally uh, started my career as being a police officer. I was a police officer in Costa Mesa, California. I was patrol. I was, uh, worked uh, uh, as a motorcycle officer. I was the first motorcycle officer in Costa Mesa, and, uh, and that, that was the best job because the uniforms were so cool. You know, that was, you know, I was single and 25, and here I am, a motorcycle officer. And that was pretty cool because you go to the academy and you wear an old T-shirt, wear Levi's, and you have old tennis shoes, and you ride these old junky motorcycles because you're training and you're falling all the time and you're crashing and you're messing things up. So they don't give you a brand new motorcycle to train with. But the day comes when you graduate, they give you a brand new uniform and a motorcycle all within the same day. So they gave me my uniform, they walked in, it was all in hanger and Daner high, black Daner boots, tight fitting blue pants, white helmet with a silver eagle, you know, midnight blue uniform, black gloves, and they give you this motorcycle bathed in chrome with blue and red lights on it and radio, it's really cool and you get on it and it's all brand new. And I went on a, on a traffic that day and I said to myself, very first day, I said to myself, I wonder what I look like. Because you got a pretty good looking uniform, right? pretty good looking motorcycle. So I got on my motorcycle and I was driving down the street and on Harbor Boulevard, there's a Kmart with a long row of windows. And uh, you can see yourself in the windows. So I'm pulling, I'm going alongside and I'm looking over and I'm saying to myself, you're the man. <laughs> and as I'm looking at myself, a young lady backs up in a yellow Volkswagen in front of me and I'm looking at myself and I hit her. And I fell onto my tight blue pants. And so my supervisor came and said, what's going on? I said, well, I was looking at myself. He says, well, we can't have a guy who's ADD driving around on a motorcycle. So they assigned me to homicide investigation. <laughs> what harm could I do to somebody who's already dead on the ground with a white chalk outline around him, right? So I, but I loved investigation. I had a skill in it. I could find things that other guys couldn't find. I'd go in a room and i said, look at that bullet hole up there. And they go, where? I said, there, where? Or that scrap of blood, where, where? where? I, I just had this gift. God gave me a gift to investigate things and to figure things out on, at a crime scene. And I loved, then I go to trial, and then sometimes the bad guy got off because they had a better attorney. We see it on TV, just you know, with this Johnny Depp thing. You get good attorneys and bad attorneys, and it could affect the outcome. But evidence should be evidence. But evidence isn't proof. Evidence is the proper interpretation of the proof. Okay, so we have to have so we have to have proper interpretation of Scripture, and people are out there trying to make the Bible into what um, what it isn't. There's a lot of people attacking the Bible. The Bible's history, the people say it contradicts itself. No, it doesn't contradict itself. It may contradict their lifestyle, it does not contradict itself. And we see things differently all the time in our culture. I've never seen things so divided in our culture. 
all over the place. We, we think like, like the, the politicians disagree, and I disagree with them. The politicians say we should defund the police. I say we should defund politicians. <laughs> My wife and I got in a little bit of an argument last week. She thought she was right about something, and I thought I was right, and we started getting a little bit of a, you know, in the wisdom of Solomon, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, I said, honey, if you admit I'm right, I'll admit I'm wrong. She says, cool, you go first. I said, I'm wrong. She says, you're right. We see things differently. Kyle, where's Kyle? I just met him out in the lobby. Kyle, where are you? Come here, Kyle, come here. Come here, Kyle. Come on. Here's how you see things differently. Come here, come here, Kyle, come on. I asked Kyle out in the lobby, I said, do you play basketball? And he said, why, do you play miniature golf? <laughs> we see things differently. I left the police department at a job that I absolutely loved I got involved in a shootout. There was a guy that uh, lit his truck on fire in his front yard, and I went there, and, and here's this truck, and it was, just, it, was just, it was just billowing with smoke. And what happened was the guy got arrested the night before for drunk driving. He, uh, he, he, uh, he, he, his wife left him. Uh, his kids left him. He lost his job. And so he wanted to kill a policeman. Uh, so he lit his truck on fire to lure a policeman there, and he just put it right in his front yard on the grass and poured gas on it and lit a brand new pickup truck on fire. And of course, I was the one that pulled up, but I was playing clothes at the time I was a detective. So um, I pull up, and uh, this truck is on fire, and I walk to the front door, and, and I'm looking at the fire, and I look, and a few feet away at the front door, there's a guy with a rifle pointed right at my head, and he had a half-drunk bottle of vodka in his hand, and he said, I'm going to kill a cop. Are you a cop? I, I said, who ordered the pizza? <laughs> so I started to go down behind my, my car, and I felt a sting in the back of my leg, real bad sting in the back of my leg. And what happened? I thought I was shot, but it was the asphalt that sprayed up from a bullet impact, and then tree branches were falling on me, and leaves and stuff were raining down because the bullets were going through. Across the street, uh, tile was popping off the roof. I saw stucco flashes from the bullet impact. Glass was breaking. I went in and curled in behind the, 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 the wheel of the car. The axle is where you want to go because yeah, the bullets aren't going to go through that. They, they go through a car, so you don't get behind the car. You get behind the wheel, so I'm curled down behind there, and this guy shot for three hours. And so CNN and all the helicopters and ABC News and everything was up above. They had sectioned off the street. There was a thousand people there uh, all wanting to see the show. You know, it was all on live TV. And this guy shot for three hours and I was pinned down and the lieutenant said, don't move. You're in a good position. And here I am, helicopter. And they're, they're just sh keep showing this helicopter, sh this, this scene of this young officer behind the behind the wheel, and uh, that's all, you know, it's just the helicopter going like this, and then all of a sudden, I realized that I had five cups of coffee in me that day. <laughs> anybody doing the math on that? I mean, is it, anybody not getting this? Because, so uh, I, uh, I had nowhere to go, literally. No, I mean, I, I, you don't want to wet your pants on TV. You know, it's never going to live it down. So I'm sitting there behind the car, and all of a sudden the guy kicked the door. Uh, and he came at me. And uh, it was at night by then, and he's coming at me, and I could see the orange flames coming out, the spitting out the end of the barrel. And he's getting closer and closer and closer. He got within 10 feet, and I couldn't wait any longer, so I just flopped over onto the hood of the car, and I had a 12-gauge shotgun with double out buck, and, and I pulled the trigger. Big ball of flame, shotgun slammed against my shoulder, heard the guy thrashing in the bushes. So uh, I ran up and saw this horrible scene of this guy staring up at me, and I'm there with a the smoking shotgun. I ran into the house. Uh, the helicopter said, and the brave officer is in the house checking for hostages. <laughs> I came out a couple minutes later, everything's okay. 
Code four, everything's okay. Oh, it just, it's just such a horrible thing to stand over another. Some of you have felt that in combat, um, even though they're shooting at you, it's just the, the humanity that you've just robbed of life. And uh, it, it just, it hollowed me out. And I went to Colorado and um, went fly fishing with my brother Paul for a couple weeks in the Terriol. And I put in my resignation. To this day, I don't know why. Um, but at the time, it really just hollowed me out. And uh, while I was in Colorado, I met a guy, uh, I was living there now in Colorado, I met a guy named Jim Irwin, the eighth man to walk on the moon. First one to drive the car on the moon. We became best of friends. Uh, how many remember seeing the astronauts walk on the moon? No, 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 live. <laughs> live. I mean, live on TV? Live, live, you saw it? If you saw, okay, stay seated, but if you saw the astronauts walk on the moon live, please stand up. Serious, and stay standing, okay? Now, those of you seated, look at these people. This is what you're going to look like when you're really old. <laughs> you can sit down. You can sit down. Take him back to the home. He's still standing back there. <laughs> I should go back to the home, right? It's, you know, I... Uh, the uh, uh, Jim was a great friend. Here's a guy that's walking on the moon. We came back. We're driving through the desert, and he's going, "Hey, there! I, I used to walk on that thing," and it was kind of cool. But but Jim Jim was uh, Jim was a unique guy, and he says, "Hey, let's go look for Noah's Ark." And uh, you want a new adventure in your life? He goes, let's go look for Noah's Ark. You're a cop. You can collect evidence if we find it and everything else. And so I did. And that started a lifelong career for me in Bible archaeology. I never planned on it. I just sort of went and looked for Noah's Ark and loved it. And then Jim said, hey, let's go speak in some churches. And we did. And then let's go look for the crossing side of the Red Sea. And we went over there on an expedition, spent two weeks on a boat diving in the ocean, looking for chariots and doing this. And so he, I got hired and I became his vice president. And, I was doing, and I've been doing this ever since. You know, I've been doing all this. And then in between it all, I, I did get arrested five times. One of them was I got arrested in Saudi Arabia. I'll talk about it a little later. And Hollywood's now in production of a movie on that right now as we speak with Dean River Production. So, but I'll tell you about the, that, that, that arrest a little bit later on. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go on an expedition to look for the real Mount Sinai. Some people say, well, wait a second. Mount Sinai is not lost. Every map shows it in the Sinai Peninsula. And why aren't we looking there? Because the Bible says it's in Arabia. Galatians 4.25 says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. So why aren't we looking in Arabia for uh, the real Mount Sinai? Because tradition is such a strong thing. Jesus says your traditions will nullify the word of God. Traditions are insidious. I'm not talking about traditions of whether you baptize them this way or you candles or smoke or whatever, or, you know, how you have Christmas or whatever. Not that kind of tradition. I'm talking about traditions dealing with salvation, traditions with dealing with who has authority. Does the church have the authority over the Bible or does the Bible have authority over the church? We've got to deal with that. And that, that's because Jesus says your traditions will nullify the word of God. The Bible says, beware lest anyone cheat you. Ooh, strong word. Be relentless when anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of man, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. Be relentless when anyone cheat you through philosophy. That's philosophia, the love of wisdom. We bow down at universities thinking that they have the answers. They don't have the answers. We bow down at politicians think they have the answers. They don't have the answers. Jesus has the answers. So beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men and not according to Christ. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding the truth from those who think themselves so wise and clever and for revealing it to the childlike. Not childish. Childish is running around eating boogers and all that stuff. Okay, that's childish. I'm talking about childlike. A childlike faith is when, let's say I'm going to jump in my father's arms from the bunk bed. I know he's going to catch me because he loves me. I have that kind of faith. You need to leap into the arms of God and have 100% trust that the Bible is foundational from the first word to the last in Scripture. You have to follow Scripture. You can't prune it to fit your agenda. And that's what a lot of people are doing today. They're pruning the Bible. 
They're adding the Bible. They're amplifying the Bible. The Bible needs to be, it's the pure word of it. It's what the reformers called ad fuentes, Latin for follow the source. Go to the source where the water comes out of the ground. It's the purest in the spring. And in a distance of time, as it goes down a hill, it gets polluted. And so the word of God, we need to go back to what the intent was of the authors. We need to find out what that was and use our studies to find out what God is saying to us. So crucial. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start a little video here. And uh, what you're going to see at the end of it, so I don't have to pause it, at the end of it is a man by the name of Clyde Morgan. He, we, we just edited this in because it's, it's, it's really great. He was, uh, he, was the, he was the pilot for Ibn Saud, the king during World War II, and for Bob Hope during World War II, flew C-47 transports. But he is, uh, he's going to give an amazing testimony as to where the, where the real Mount Sinai is, according to the king of Saudi Arabia back in 1945. Um, I actually went to uh, film him, and he was hours away from dying. So we propped him up and put on his old World War II outfit, and he gave us a great testimony. Uh, and so he was quite, quite ill at the time. So, but he does a pretty good job of, of, uh, of expressing himself. So we'll start the video. We can. There we go. This is Queen Helena. She was a mother of Constantine, the emperor of Rome. She was a fortune teller, and she guessed that Mount Sinai was in the Sinai Peninsula. That's all we have today that shows us that this is Mount Sinai. This is it. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All oh, pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Hey. 10, 10 commandments <laughs> for all to obey. I don't think that's the way it went, but it's fun. Uh, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Anybody have a problem with this? Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Arabia has never been in the Sinai Peninsula. That's where Pharaoh had his turquoise mines and his copper mines, and all the scholars will say it has to be there because that was Arabia at one time. It's never been Arabia. Sorry, scholars. I know you want to make this out to be true, but it's not true that the, the, the Mount Sinai is in. The Bible says that they went around by the desert road, being the children of Israel, fleeing Pharaoh, and they went and they camped at Pirath, Migdal, and Bezaphon. The Bible literally says they turned back and were hemmed in by the wilderness. You see where they're hemmed in by the wilderness here? This is the place that we feel that they crossed through the Red Sea. We do a great study on this. This is going to be part of the new TV show, is that we have found 17 points that show that this has to be the crossing side of the Red Sea and not up in Nueva's a lot of people suggest. Then they cross through the Red Sea on dry ground. Isaiah 51 says, I'll make for you a roadway through the sea. We have an underwater land bridge here. Moses raised his staff in his hand. The children went through on dry ground and the waters came back and killed all of the Egyptian army. And so uh, this is a great miracle. People say it didn't happen, um, but um, we have physical evidence to show that this is uh, where they went through on dry ground. Isaiah 51 gives us the clue. Um, it's, uh, it's a reef that goes really across to two different continents. From the, so we, so the, the Bible says in, uh, that uh, they were in the ancient land of Midian. That's where uh, Moses met God at the burning bush was in the ancient land of Midian. And Flavius Josephus Demetrius in Philo from 250 BC says that the real Mount Sinai was the highest mountain in Madian or Midian, and this is Midian or Madian, the ancient land of Midian. So Flavius Josephus Demetrius Philo, why have we ignored them? Great historians from 250 BC. The highest mountain is Jabal Allah's. And what is unique about this mountain is I went there in 1988 with Larry Williams. He was the father of Michelle Williams. You know the actress that is, uh, got four Academy Award nominations? Um, there's the top of the mountain is, is Blackened Peak there on top of the mountain. Why is this important? Because God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. The fire will build it up like smoke from a furnace. It was just hot. It melted rocks. And now we were just doing the TV show on this and looking at the rocks. And the geologists have said that they are melted rock. 
They're, they're, not, they're not volcanic. All scholars will say this is volcanic. Well, I climbed the mountain, and you can see they're granite on the inside and they're melted black on the outside. So now Hollywood's going to do this movie on it, and da 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 yada yada. We're not going to talk about that. But I went there uh, a year and a half ago, and what we did, or two years ago, I'm sorry, what we did is we got new photos for you, clear ones. Because I, when I went over there, I had the grainy 35 analog shots, and it got really messed up with the heat in the desert. So we're going to go back to Saudi Arabia 2020 and give you these new fresh shots. The government's allowed us to go in. I went through with Jim Schmidt, who's the producer of Dean River Productions on the left, done many movies. The guy on the right is Ron Matson, president of K-House. Chuck Missler's organization. We went over there and we climbed the mountain. Uh, I climbed the mountain 33 years ago and it was a little bit easier, but I did make it up. And so here I am up on top of the mountain and you can see all around the mountaintop, it's black on top. And when you take the rock and you take it, uh, it's melted on the inside and it's granite on the inside. Literally melted, melted. Geologists are blown away at this. They have no explanation, but it is melted rock. God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. Moses built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Now this is specific, foot of the mountain. You see out here is the desert to the left, and then you go up here, and you go, and you get to the foot of the mountain, where you can see to the right, where the mountain goes up. It's right at the foot. It's pushed right up at the foot. It's 60 feet by 60 feet. It's an altar, and this is what we believe that the Bible's literally talking about when it says the foot of the mountain. And they set up 12 stone pillars. So are we going to find 12 stone pillars here? Uh, we find these stone pillars scattered about the ground. Uh, they're surface located. So why are they on the surface? Shouldn't they be buried underneath 50 feet after all these years? No, there's no civilization that's come here after to build because there's no water. So they'll be here another thousand years like this. So we have altar, we have these pillars sitting on top of the ground. Now, they made a golden calf. When Moses didn't come down from the mountain, they made for themselves a golden calf. And so this altar behind Jim here, Schmidt, is a man-made altar. All those big boulders were pushed into place. And all around them are bulls. The Apis bull, you remember, they, they, this, is a pic, this is a picture of the Egyptian. This is not from the altar, but it's a picture of what Apis looked like. But they made, did they worship the bull god, Apis and Hathor, the Egyptian deity? So Moses didn't come down from the mountain. They rebelled, and they had a big orgy. So we asked the Bedouins there, and the Bedouins go, yes, there are rocks around here with, with uh, carvings on them that are of an orgy scene right at the golden calf altar. And if you look carefully at these men in these pictures here, um, they are all in a state of arousal. So we have, we have uh, a, a, an orgy scene right here playing out right at the golden calf altar. And not only that, but the golden calf altar, there's three offers. The, the left is the golden calf altar. There's two more with bulls on them, and they're really uniquely shaped, and they're spread out a certain thing, and they're in the same line as Orion's belt, which is the exact same. Now we're going to superimpose this over the pyramids in Egypt, and they're exactly the same as the pyramids in Egypt. So they're from Egypt, and they're worshiping Egyptian deities. So they made these golden calf altars in the same line as Orion's belt, in the same distance and size as the pyramids. Very interesting. Now, the Bible says that, that Moses, when they, they cried out for water, Moses struck a rock and the water came from the rock. Now, you're one of the first people to see this. We had a drone footage over there and we went over there like, I've only shown this to about three churches so far. So you're one of the first to see it, probably the largest church to see it. So Moses struck the rock and water came from it. So this rock is, has evidence of distinct water erosion. It's split, called the split rock at Horeb. Um, and so I'm inside the rock with Ron Matson there. Just to give you an idea of the size of it, um, this will give you... Now, is this, what's this rock doing perched up here that split? Because inside it is evidence of water erosion. You see all these little cups and eddies and, and where water's and kind of swirling around in it? Um, when Moses struck the rock, a lot of water came out, and this is all water erosion. Geologists look at this and say, wait a second, this is pressure flake from the top down. It's, it's opposite of what, or from the down, down, down up. It's, it's not what you'd find in normal erosion patterns. So we have, look at these eddies and curves and swirls and dry waterfalls and stuff coming. This is a, now, 
when I'm sitting here with the team, I'm saying, wait a second, this is where Moses raised his hands and his staff with the battle of the Amalekites. And so when Aaron and Hur raised his hands, and so the Bible talks about right here, there should be an altar. And I'm telling my team, there's going to be an altar in one of these rock piles here because we have, the Bible says, and Moses built an altar and called it, Lord is my banner. Has to be an altar. So I'm looking at these rock piles and my guy is saying, we're going to go have lunch. I said, there's going to be an altar in one of these. I said, that's a big one. Let's go pull rocks off that. They were saying, you're crazy. I said, no. Nope. I said, the Bible says it's going to be an altar. I pulled the rocks off and sure enough, there's an altar underneath. 30 feet by about, 33 feet by about 22 feet. Look at the straight lines of this altar. That was underneath the rocks. So I just followed what the Bible said. It's not, not hard. It's not rocket science. It's just, you know, what the Bible said, and I trusted it would be there. So therefore, the place was called Kibroth Hatava because they, uh, there they uh, buried the people who had craved other food. So there's two death scenes. We have the we have the, the quail that came and the people died eating the quail. There's a lot of, even with food on their, in, in their teeth, the Bible says, they, there's, they built. And then we have the 3,000 killed by Moses when he came down from the mountain. He had 3,000 people killed when getting in the Ten Commandments. But anyway, this is an area of the world that has no water. So why, are we, well, why did we find a grave site here that had 3,000 graves? No roads, no water, no evidence of any civilization ever being there, yet we have 3,000 graves jammed together, and they have uh, manna stones. You know where they ground the manna? You see this is where they ground the manna on hand mills, the Bible says? All through this are, are, are places, mortar and pestles, where they would have ground the manna, and we have, uh, we have gravestones here, 3,000. Thousand graves, exactly number that the Bible said, and dating back, according to the archaeologists, 3,500 years ago, which is the date of the Exodus. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle with witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron and the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe al almonds. We need an almond tree to have ripe almonds, right? So there's no almond trees in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is three times the size of Texas. So there's no almond trees in the area. But yet on this mountain, we found on the north flank six almond trees. It's dormant. They're still living. These are the relatives, I believe, of, the, uh, of what, what Aaron had. But you can see the almond tree here. That, is an, uh, that, that bears fruit. They, they'll, they'll say we're here in February, so it's it gone dormant. But now it's, it, it's, it's blossoming right about now. You can see blossoms on it this time of year. So we found the almond trees on this mountain. And then around the mountain, uh, there's a guy by the name, Dr. Kim. He was a doctor for the royal family. We've become good friends. He said he collected all these objects from around the mountain uh, in the region. And uh, this particular, uh, you know, if you find a, a, a menorah, it's contemporaneous to Christ. It's headline news. Look at this very uh, obtuse markings on this but you have a menorah. What's a menorah be doing in Saudi Arabia in the shadow of Mecca? This is dated 600 years before Christ. According to the Field Museum and the University of Chicago, it's about 600 years, and it has a menorah, and it has an eldest, the oldest lettering of El Shaddai anywhere in the world. This is the, uh, the, the pin is in here for size perspective, but you can see uh, the face there and the backside has some unique lettering. We call this the Moses. No, Moses came down from the mountain. He had the Shekinah glory of God on his face. Look at what this spells. Y-H, Y-H, according to ancientscripts.com. Y-H, and then you turn it over, the little pitchfork is H. Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh. On this, so we call this the Moses. Now these are this is gold jewelry dug up at the mountain you just saw. Why is this important? Because the Egyptians were plundered by the, the Hebrews and they took their gold and silver as base material to build uh, the Ark of the Covenant and other implements inside the tabernacle. But look at that charioteer's glove, Egyptian gold jewelry, uh, Egyptian artifacts, all amazing stuff. Now, this is Clyde Morgan. He flew C-147s. C and he was uh, the pilot for Bob Hope and for the king, Ibn Saud. And so uh, 
fa fascinating, fascinating character. I was surprised that he lived. He was still alive when we went and interviewed him. Uh, 94 years old, but this C-147 transport, or C-47 transport, it was, uh, um, uh, it, it, it was given by FDR to the king. And this is what it's the king said. It's an honor to meet you. Well, thank uh, you. We have, we, our lives have intersected possibly in something very historic. And we're talking about where the real Mount Sinai uh, yeah. is located. And uh, I had no idea that someone as far back as World War II would have seen the mountain and had been told that the mountain was the holy mountain of Moses. Did any of the Muslims tell you that that was a holy oh, mountain? Oh yes, oh yes. In well, they've been made to fly around it, and it was off limits that I'd be killed either by God or by maybe some of them, I don't know. But I flew around it anyway. <laughs> Couldn't, was tempted to fly around it because it was holy. So when you took off and you were flying, did you actually see that mountain in the oh. northwest quadrant of Saudi Arabia? Oh, yes, I flew with them. Probably a thousand yards, two thousand yards of it all the way around it. Well, around the time it was dark, the mountain uh, was black almost, so I guess you'd call it that. It was dark enough to be uh, somewhat frightening, really. But it was different than the rest of the mountains because it was black on top? Oh, it was a blackish green. I'm going to bring out a map. Yes. And this map is of the area that you were flying around then. And what, what kind of airplane were you flying around? The C-47 airplane that flew okay. most transport during World War II. And you, can you show me the area that you were flying around? It would be right in there. Yes, yeah, so we're talking about the same mountain. Yeah, they told me it was Mount Sinai, that it was the mountain of Moses. Well, Sheik Yusuf Yusin was the one that was in charge of, of uh, the Arabian Air Force for that, and uh, he uh, said it was off limits that I'd be killed if I flew around it. And when I took off, I was half scared to death. You don't know what I really believe. I think it's Mount Sinai. I think God let me fly around it. That's what I think. I think he let me, you and me both will. And I said, I want to believe in my God, and I did. And I stayed with God, and he, he stood by me. And did it, did it touch your heart to have that? It still does. Well, Clyde, I, I called three months after this filming to send money or flowers or a gift to the causes that he believed in and his memory of him. Show respect to the family. Of what a great life. He became a doctor. He served as a doc family doctor after the war. Uh, and um, just a dear, dear, sweet guy. But a couple hours before this, uh, the, the, the daughter told me that he was almost in a comatose state. He just sat there. And they put the uniform on him, and he just came to life. And uh, so I, I called and said, uh, you know, where, where do I send? And he goes, she goes, so I called three months later, and she says, he's still alive. He just went to church with us. And I said, what? The? I said, what's the deal? What's the deal? I mean, he was just, you tell me he had just hours to live. She goes, well, you know, he, he you know, and he let, went to live nine more months. I said, what's the trick? And she said, well, you, you put them in that uniform, Bob, and all these little old ladies from hospice would come in, and he'd tell stories all day long about the war, and they just were all excited about him and fluttering around him, and she says, he just lived on and on. God, am I telling it wrong, or is it just, <laughs> is it, did I do too much? Is it just, too, I got, I'll tone it down a little bit. So Clyde, um, dear, dear sweet guy, right? And uh, here, here, here's the testimony. The king of Saudi Arabia said, this is the real Mount Sinai. Folks, this is huge. We're dealing with, you know, and people say, well, what's, what's important to even find archaeological stuff? Well, Jesus talked 
taught in evidence-based education. When Thomas was non-believing, he says, look at the holes in my hands and my side. And Thomas fell down and said, my Lord, my God. It's really important. In Deuteronomy, God said, I showed you these things that you know that I'm the Lord God. You know, people say today there's no miracles. <laughs> what? You see a baby be born. Don't you see a miracle? Anybody see a baby be born ever? That, that's, a, that's a miracle. Um, just last week, my brother-in-law took me out to lunch. That's a miracle. We, we have miracles all the time. You know, I, uh, I was arrested over there, and this is what the movie's about. Is so I'll, I'll tell you the arrest scene because everybody wants me to tell it. But um, Larry and I were over there. Uh, we had snuck into the country. We had forged documents. For this, I'm ashamed. At the time in 88, I had an astronaut telling me, you go in and find this thing. It's going it's to be the biggest archaeological find in history. More important than me going to the moon. And more dangerous than me going to the moon. I got a guy telling me this. I went to the moon. And I went over there because it was a closed country and you had to get used unique ways to get in. Am I sorry that I did it that way? Yes. I wouldn't have done it that way, but, but I, it's done and I did it. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story. We got arrested over there and we realized we were in deep trouble. And so they thought we were Jewish spies. So what they did is they took us and we were driving out with our film and everything on our little white pickup truck with Larry. And we're all celebrating, high five, and hey, we found Mount Sinai. We got these films. Aren't we, aren't we clever and creative? And we got arrested. Sobering, sobering really quick. Where they threw us in a cell, it was a mud-walled cell. The, the walls were all stained with gun grease and soldier, and, and, and soldier sweat. And they had a, just killed a, a lamb right at the doorstep, so it just flies wherever you're there. The ground was covered in ants. They pulled us on a scrap of, of carpet on some sand. They took our passports, our keys, and they put guns to our heads. And they took our shoes off so we couldn't escape. And where, where are you going to go, right? It's 250 miles across the desert with no water, no shoes, no nothing. So we're not getting out of there. So they're putting guns to our heads, and they're calling us Jews. And we would have spit running down our face. They'd put guns, and they'd put the cold barrels up to our temples, and they'd pull the trigger, click, and we'd flinch. And they did this hour after hour. And we thought, this is, we're done. We're literally, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to be an unmarked grave for all eternity out there. And Larry goes and sits up and says to them, don't kill us, he's a doctor. And the head guard comes over, and he's a stubby guy, and he had an eye that was completely infected with pus, and it was syrupy red, sclera, and a pus was going down, and it was infected really bad. And he picks me up with these tree trunk arms, and he points his finger in my chest and says, are you a doctor? And I nervously said, yes. And I looked down at Larry and said, what am I going to do? And Larry says, I don't know. You're the doctor. <laughs> so I went out to my car and I had a, a shave kit. Now in Saudi Arabia, when a baby's born, they wash it in camel urine. When they brush their teeth, they take a stick and they brush their teeth with a little stick. That's it. That's all the tech that they have. Medical tech. Yeah, that's it. So I had this shave kit full of all this cool stuff from Walgreens and CVS and from doctors, and I unzipped it. And I mean, when I go, I like to kick a lot of stuff. Doctors give you stuff when you go, pills for um, sleep, for uh, infection, for diarrhea, for pain, whatever you want. I have all these prescription bottles in there. I got all, So I unzip it, and I got all this cool stuff. And they're looking at it. And so the one guy comes up to me, and he says, I, he's got a cut hand, and it was infected. And I took Ban Roll on. And I put it on the band roll on, right? The head guard with the, with, the, with the red eye, I took some Visine, and he put, it, put his head back. I put it in. He fluttered. He didn't like it. He was really agitated. But he fluttered, and I put some more. And I said, just wait. It'll work. Put it more in there. And after about a few minutes, all the guards were going, ah, it's turning white. That stuff really works, that Visine. It's amazing stuff. And so they're all thinking, he's really a doctor. So they put down their rifles, and they become very compliant like little children. It's like the Seinfeld thing with the soup Nazi. Remember that? They come forward. They want, you know, the one guy had a, kind of a hurt back, and he goes, he goes into his back, and Larry goes, you know what I think we got here? I said, Larry, shut up. I'm the doctor. <laughs> so I take out sleeping pills. 
These aren't the wimpy Ambien, like second all stuff that'll put down a rhinoceros. So I under the top and I give him five pills. I said, take, give one to each one of the guards. He goes, Tomom, Tomom. He takes all of them. The next guy comes up. He wants five pills. I give him five pills. I look down at Larry. Larry's going, work it, Bob. Work it, work it. <laughs> so the next guy, he wants five pills. So they all get their pills and they fell asleep. And we took our truck and our keys there and we escaped across the desert. And so Hollywood loves this movie because they, anyway, yeah. I don't want to ruin the book, but I do live, okay? So in the desert of Saudi Arabia, I saw Bedouins out there one time sitting, and time goes so slow in the desert. Okay? You all live in the desert. Let me tell you about Moses. Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh. His hair was braided with gold. He had gold braided sandals. He didn't even wash himself. He went into the Nile River and he had attendants wash him and then put white linen on him. He was in the house of Pharaoh. He killed an Egyptian being a Hebrew slave and had to go to Saudi Arabia to hide out. And that's where he met his wife, Sapor and his father-in-law, Jethro. And one scene in the Bible shows him tending the flock of sheep for Jethro. Look at this, over 80 years old. He was real successful. Now he's tending his father-in-law's flock. He doesn't even have his own flock of sheep. And his sons are not with him. The Bible says he has at least two sons. One was Gershom. means I'm an alien in foreign land. He has sons that aren't helping him. And not only that, he's on the backside of the desert. In other words, the farest away as you can go. And there he's tending sheep. And there God comes down and touches him and ha- asks him to go against Pharaoh. To lead the people out of slavery. He was covered in dust and dirt. He looked like a street person, probably, being out in the desert. His hair was probably full of dried sheep dung from following the sheep and being out there in the desert, sleeping on the ground with the scorpions in the dirt. So he went from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. And where did God use him? When he was in the lowest of the low. The word for desert is midbar. It comes in the verb daver, which means to speak. In other words, the desert speaks to you. The desert spoke to Moses then. And at 80 plus years, he became arguably the second most incredible man in all biblical history. God stripped him down to the bare wood. Some of you are going through the desert right now. Relationships, sickness, finances, whatever. God is going to use you. He speaks to you in the desert. Some of you are going through the desert. And that's the beautiful thing about Moses as he shows us that at any time, in any age, God can use you in mighty ways. Now, I want to go back to my father. I want to close with this. My father I loved and hated at the same time. But that's really an awkward thing when you have a relationship like that with your father. Men in general have some issues with fathers and sons and things like that. Most will have one. It just comes with the being father and sons. My dad was told he had cancer and was dying. He was in a hospice care up, or a hospital up in Prescott. I said it right, Prescott, right? You don't say Prescott, you get in trouble when you do that? My dad was there, and the doctor comes in with a clipboard. Young guy, real clean cut, Ivy League looking, very blunt, very cold. And he flips open the thing, and he says to my dad, you have cancer all through your body. Prepare to meet your creator. Close the clipboard, walks out. My dad looks at me through scared eyes and said, what is going to happen to me? when I die. He was younger than me right now, about six years younger than I am right now. He said, what's going to happen to me when I die? I said, Dad, according to Scripture, according to your lifestyle, according to what you have professed and done in your life, you're going to spend all eternity separated from God in a place called hell. He said to me, um, is there any hope for me? I said, yes, this is the good news. I said, 
Dad, you know, you know Noah had a, had a boat? It's called the ark. I've looked for it. You know all those years that you talked to me about, why do I look for Noah's ark? I said, when, when, when Noah... When, when Noah uh, what was built the ark with his three sons, his wife, and their three wives, um, God called him into the ark. He didn't tell him to go in the ark. He didn't say, you go in the ark. He called him into the ark. And he did. And when the door closed on the ark, that sealed their fate. All those inside the ark survived. All those outside the ark perished. When that door closed in that ark, can you imagine all the relatives that Noah had at the time, how old he was? And they, the people would have, as the rain came, women, can you just imagine being your children gathering around you and the water comes up to your calves and then your thighs and then your waist and you're beating on the side of the ark with bloody fists, screaming to get in to save your family and you can't because the door on the ark was closed. All those inside the ark survived, all those outside the ark perished. I said, Dad, there's no spiritual Switzerland. There's no place in the middle. That's the fallacy that the world wants to teach you is there is a place in the middle. You're either in the ark or you're out of the ark. He says, but I'm just too much of a sinner. Folks, if you knew, I said, we're all sinners. If you knew what God knew about me, you wouldn't have invited me here. And if I knew what God knew about you, I wouldn't have come. We're all sinners. Jesus is the only solvent that could wipe, the blood of Jesus is the only solvent that can wipe and clean away sin. That's it. The only collateral that you need to get into heaven is not money, it's through Christ dying for you on the cross. Even though we're, we're sinners, we're saved by grace through faith and not by anything we do. You can't work your way into heaven. It's a free gift and you have to accept it. It's like God was calling Noah into the ark. He's calling you into a relationship with him. And some of you are going to go in. Some of you aren't. When my dad's heart stopped, the door was shut. And he either was in the ark or out of the ark. And so my dad said, I want to know Christ. He said the sinner's prayer with me. God, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, making him Lord and Savior. That's the same thing happened at the cross. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, there was two people on either side of him. They really portrayed all society today. Two people. Criminals, deserving of death. Jesus in the middle. One of them said, hey, mocking. If you're God, get yourself down off that thing and get us too. Free us from this. You're God, do it. Do your God stuff. And the other one said, don't you fear God? We're the ones that have sinned. This man's done nothing. He turned to Jesus and says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Two men equally close to life. Two men equally close to death. Two men equally close to the Son of God at the most intense moment in all of history. And one was mocking and one accepted. That one is in paradise that accepted. The other one is not. My dad said that prayer. And with tears going down his face, his whole face changed. Talk about being born again. His whole face changed. His whole countenance, everything about him softened. And these lines that were on his face were etched in there deep through alcohol and anger and cigarettes washed away. Such a pleasant image of my father I have now. I can see him right now as if he's just yesterday. Well, the doctor said he had two to six months to live, so I went home, Colorado. I can't be there for two to six months. I had a family, had obligations, had a job. I got home, I threw my keys on the thing. It was three o'clock in the morning, looking out the window at the city lights. Remember the blinking lights and stuff that go on at night, just thinking about dad, and all of a sudden the phone rang. Startled, it's my mother crying. They just put a sheet over your father's face. He's dead. Hung up the phone. I got the biggest smile on my face. Not because he's dead, because he's living. Because he's living for all eternity with God, forgiven of his sins. Because he went on 
the ark. I pray that you, thank you. I pray the most dangerous trip you're going to take if you don't know Christ as your Savior and ask for forgiveness is out those doors today. That's a frightening concept to me to think that you're going to go out there and not be on the ark. So I'm going to let the pastor come up and we're going to have him uh, close right now. But I want to thank you for having me.